In the last video, we saw how we can move cards from one array to the other, put them on the table and list them and get them back into a player's hand. And in this following video, we will see how we can actually put this into a very basic game loop where the players will not be very smart, but at least they'll play and win. This we also still need to do. So we need to do a game loop. In this case, we, we're not playing it uh, using a for loop because the for loop only runs a certain amount of time. We want to do this until one of the players has no more cards. And there is a different type of loop. And I will open my browser. And here you see that I looked up what we did before. Um, and let's go into the Julia documentation, which is also something that I wanted to show you. And if you open the manual, there is a getting started tutorial, which is very helpful. But there's also control flow, uh, which is what we want. We want to change the uh, flow, uh, compound expressions, conditional short circuit, repeated evaluation, loops. We want to have a loop. And the for loop, this one we already knew. And the new one that we now use is the while loop. While there is a condition, end. Um, the question is, do we have a do while loop? So there's the kind of other way around where we check it at the end. Um, this can be achieved by calling breaks. Um, let's do the while loop. Okay, so we have to do, let's go back here, while, um, and what has to be true? Let's put it while true, and so anything that is in here will be executed infinitely long. So if I print line a star, if I run this, this will run forever. It will never, never stop. And the only way to stop this, if, you ever, if you're ever stuck in something like this, is by going control C. This is uh, interrupt, interrupting the program control C. And now you should probably restart your REPL and so while true is the bad idea. So we want to what we want to see is while um, we want that all of the decks have more than one card. So um, while all decks have more than one card. So how do we how do we do that? Let's first do while false so this never happens. How do we figure out that all decks have a card? If we do dex of 1 and length of dex of 1 larger than 0 then now I ran the whole thing let's execute all of this so we actually can test this um, so this says player 1 still has cards this says player 2 still has cards um, and we want that both of them are true. And getting testing whether two things both are true at the same time is what in logic is called AND. We want A to be true and B to be true. And one thing I'm always forgetting is, is it a single ampersand or is it a double ampersand? I'm not, not sure. And if we are not sure, we can easily look it up. And we would do this by, no, I don't, let's open the manual again. Integers, mathematical operations, elementary functions. I think this is an elementary functions. This is how to add things. Uh, Boolean operators. So expressions that can be true or false um, are so-called Boolean uh, values and we can calculate with them using boolean operators. We can negate an expression. So if it's true, then if it was true, then after negating the expression, it becomes false. And we can we can have these so-called short circuiting and and we can have the short circuiting or. The why it is called short circuiting, I will. There is no non-short circuiting and, by the way. So I'll explain what that means. So we use double ands. And what this does, it evaluates whether this expression is true, 
And if that is true, it will then evaluate if this expression is true and then return um, whether the whole expression is true. So if I just call this, this is true because both players still have one card. And the benefit of the, um, what was the name again, short circuiting AND is, AND can only ever be true if all of the things are true. So what it does, it evaluates this expression, and if this is false, it immediately returns false and does no longer do this. So if, for example, there is one thing that you can quickly check um, whether it's true or not, and you, you, and you have to use an AND, then you can very easily put this at the front, and then if there's something that's very lengthy to do that you need to verify, put that at the end, because if the quick thing already fails, it does not have to execute the lengthy part in the end. So if there's two, thing, two conditions that need to be true, check the easy one first and the hard one second. The opposite is true for OR. If only one of the expressions needs to be true, then um, it will also cancel the uh, calculating the rest of the operation if the first operation, if this is already true and there were an OR here, by the way the OR is achieved by doing uh, the pipe symbol. And if you don't know where the pipe symbol is, on a Macintosh is by holding down the Option key and pressing the 7. I think at least it's on German Macintosh keys. If you don't know how to do the pipe symbol, how to do pipe symbol on keyboard, um, there is you'll, you'll find documentation for that. So the OR expression, it will cancel the rest of the evaluation if the first expression is true, because then obviously in an OR case, if only one of the things, or if at least one of the things needs to be true, this can finish after knowing that this is true. So in the OR case, it makes sense that the easy things that might evaluate to true should be in the beginning of the condition as well. But in this case, we can only play if both players have cards, not if only one player has cards. Um, and I think this is the condition that we need for two players. So while both, while the first player and the second player, while both still have cards, we can do the game loop. So all of this we can now move inside of here. And now this should play, I mean, in this case, the first player always wins uh, because we just give him the cards. We don't do any actual evaluation. But the game loop looks like this. We empty the, we create a new space on the table. Both players put one card down and um, player one gets all of, the, all of the cards. So this is a very unfair game. Player one will always win. And we can also do this. Uh, at the end, we can announce the winner. Um, if, and we can basically take uh, this here, if the length of dex 1 is larger than 0, the, uh, we don't need then, that's a different language, print on, and we put some asterisks in here so that we see it, player 1 has 1, else we do player Two has one, which will never happen because player two doesn't get a chance at the moment. So we can now run the game and player one has one. No more cards to hand out. And here in this case, we could also print who won. Print on player one, one round X. We don't know the round number yet because we haven't counted it yet. So player two won two rounds, and now he has won the game. And player two has never won the game because they don't actually play against each other. So the active, what we should now do is, this is probably, we can put this down here. The active player will look at, the car, at this card and pick a value to compete with. So how would we do this? Now, the active player, um, so the question would be, how would the players pick a, um, a card? And let's say the first player, um, first player always picks. 
So what values do we have? We have the name and the top speed. He always picks top speed. And the second player um, picks randomly. Let's say we don't know. He's a newbie and he's trying to... I don't know who's, who has the better strategy. We'll see that. We'll see who has the better strategy, if one of these strategies is superior to the other. So now we have to pick who is um, playing at the moment. So for this we would say if active player is 1, that is the first player, then we do the top speed thing, else we do something else, and and depending on who wins, so here we need to compare passive player. We'll look at the value yeah, that will happen in comparison. Uh, how do we do this? Let's say the first player picks top speed. So we should have a way of looking at what to look at. So this is one. Well, how many values do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six. So we should address it. Um, is that possible? Let's have a look. If we do, we have a car somewhere. Uh, let's get this car, and let's do some testing. How can we access this car? Let's do no C is a bad. Don't do single character variables unless it's I J and other iterators. So let's call this our supercar is just for testing anyway so we have now in the variable supercar we can access the top speed by calling supercar top speed but can we also access the attribute by array we cannot get index I'm not sure how we can easily do this except for maybe doing a switch which you haven't seen yet um, Let's do it the easy way first, as always. Easy first, uh, hard things later. So we actually, the comparison we'll do in here, for if the active player, then we'll have a look at um, if we look at the card, the first card on table is the one by the first player, dot top speed, no, he always picks top speed, so we try to figure out which card has the highest top speed. And if it's the first card, then it's the first player who wins. If it's the second, then it's the second player who wins. So can we f do this maybe by sort? Let's ask Google. That's a good, uh, good idea to always do that. Sort array of by field in Julia. Sorting area of struct in Julia. Mutable struct empties that has a begin time, a finish time, and revenue. It creates a population. And I want to sort this population based on revenue. There's a whole way of sorting function. The key functions are sort or sort exclamation point. Let's sort by something. Okay, let's try that. Sort cards on table, comma, by. How did they say that? Get revenue. Oh, it's a, you have to define a accessor function. Mm, that's okay, we can, um, we can define this. So um, we'll do it in here, but we should do it somewhere else. Get top speed of a car is basically, so we can write functions in a single line. C dot top speed. Is that how, oh, it's just doing the equal. So by doing this, by get top speed. Let's see if this works. 
cards on table not defined because this wasn't executed. Area must be non-empty because we didn't run any. Oh, we no, the game was lost. That's why. So let's do all of this. So we have our decks sorted, and we do we put two cards on the table. We assume active player is one, and we sort the cards on table by top speed. So the Mini Cooper has the smallest top speed, and the BMW has the biggest top speed. Is that if we... That kind of works, I guess, but uh, how do we now determine the sorting in the... How was it sorted? Was it switched or not? Okay, this seems to be a little bit too complicated, so we do it even easier. We do it manually. We manually compare if the first card is better than the second card. So we look at cards on table one dot dot top speed that is 180. Um, if that is bigger bigger than cards on table two dot top speed. If they are tied, by the way, then the second player, or the other player, wins, so to say. So this evaluates whether the first, whether the top speed was actually a good choice, and in this case it wasn't. Um, and so we do if. If the player wins, else, end. So if the first player wins, we can push these cards here, else we push the cards here, and also in this case the active player becomes player 2, because the other player wins, and then we should obviously say player 2 one round x. Since we're counting the rounds x here, let's do something here. Uh, rounds played, oops, played is zero, and um, we count this, does this work by the way, I have, I'm not sure, no it doesn't, uh, plus equals one, does this work, rounds, I have not initialized this, if I initialize this, does the plus equal, yeah, that works. So that's an increment, it increments it by one. Um, and we can now add the rounds played here just in the notification. Um, if you want to print a variable, you basically just write dollar and parentheses, and you can just write a Julia expression that will be evaluated and put into a string. So in this case, if player one plays this, he looks at the top speed, and if his is higher, he gets the cards. If his is lower, player two gets the card and becomes the active player. Now here we have the situation where the second player is active and nothing happens here. If nothing happens, then the game will run infinitely. And actually the game can run infinitely if we don't have very good strategies. Um, actually it can always run infinitely, so we should probably if, let's say, if the second player, if he plays, he just hands out the control back to player one. And that's obviously not a, not a fair, not a correct game move, but we can implement his strategy later. We'll just see if this termin terminates or not. And we should probably check if rounds played is larger than 100, so we'll play 100 rounds max. Um, then um, if rounds played equal is larger than 100, then we should break. Um, end. Because it could happen that if the cards are aligned in a way that they go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth, we want to avoid that. So now let's run all of this minigame where player one has this very effective strategy of picking high speed and player two just says, oh wait, it's your turn again. And let's see, this runs, 
Um, rounds played is not defined. Rounds played plus equal one. Uh, where is it not defined? In line 110. Wait, what? Uh, let's read. Sometimes the the thing that we want to read is actually uh, that we can read is actually helpful. Assignment to runs by in soft scope is ambiguous because a global variable exists, treated as a new local. Disambiguate by using local rounds played, or press. Yeah, that makes more sense. So this is a global variable because otherwise, if it. Whoops! What did I do now? I don't know what I. Oh, it's I looked in the Git. Well, they, these are the Git changes, by the way. If, if you're familiar with Git, you can see where I changed something compared to uh, the la latest edit. So we want to assess access the global variable here, global rounds played. And I hope the rest is OK, because uh, these are just calling variables and not changing variables. Is it running? Does it do anything? Let's terminate the REPL and run our code again. Assignment to active player. OK, we did the same thing with active player, apparently. So active player, we assigned that. Where did we do that? Here. This is a global variable. and. Here we are inside of a loop, and if we are inside of a loop and accessing a global variable, uh, technically, if you are assigning a new variable here, it will only be meaningful inside of this. So if I, let's put something like x, y, z equals 10, and this is inside of a while loop, it's inside of a block, then outside of this block, x, y, z does not exist. So we can define a local variable that is only local to the block that we're in, and it will not, um, will not um, interfere with variables outside of its scope. We call this scoping. That's the range where it is valid. Um, but sometimes this is kind of ambiguous because there is a variable rounds played, and here we define rounds played by adding one to it. We access the variable rounds played. And this could happen on accident. We could use a variable inside that we already used outside of um, the scope. And to prevent this error, we must tell Julia that we really want this global variable. We want the variable that is defined outside of the scope. We don't need to do this when we read the variable, because obviously it only reads the one that's available. If there's, if there's a local one, it takes a local one. If there's no local one but a global one, it picks the global one. But the active player here, whenever we change that, we also should add a global here in this case. Be careful with global, um, because if you're nesting inside of nesting inside of nesting loops, it picks the one that is on top of the uh, hierarchy, so to say. And in this case, player two won the game. Player two won the game. Player one won the game. Player two won the game. And this game ends quickly because there's not many rounds to play. This one took four rounds. Why is there no... Oh because player two won the second round um, and then gives it back to player one and then but nobody wins in this in this case so then we skip directly to round four in this case player four wins the game so even if player one does nothing we can basically see that player two wins not all of them but a lot of the games by just being passive in this case Okay, I think this should be it for now. We have the most basic version of our game. We can evaluate it where one player will win or lose the game. And in the next session, we'll add the second strategy and then we'll have a look at how to evaluate these games. And um, yeah, I'll see you in the next video.